Hello, everyone. This is a special early Thanksgiving present edition of uh, a slice of space here. This is Christopher Mick with the Hudson Area Public Library. We have been doing these amazing STEM videos and they keep getting better every week. And this is probably my favorite one we've done so far because we have uh, the amazing Kelly Girardi here who has a brand new book she's going to be talking about. And then we have an old friend, uh, Abigail Bolenbach, who we've interviewed before. She's kind of agreed to join us because I wanted to make it a little bit of a different. I'm editing these videos. I'm getting really tired of looking at just my face, interviewing someone and uh, doing the questions back and forth. And the awesome subject matter that's in Kelly's book, I thought lent itself to doing kind of more of a round table and talking about social media influences on being a science communicator and just on where things are at with space right now and new people coming up into it and kind of an inspiration and, and who they're looking to and what they're talking about. So I wanted to have Abigail involved in this too and, and just kind of kick it around and see where the conversation goes. So I'm gonna stop talking right now and toss it over to Kelly. Kelly, if you would like to introduce yourself really quick and then I will be talking about your book, but uh, a lot of my, my fans that have been watching this stuff probably have not heard about you before because I haven't been able to talk to you until today. And so I just love you to introduce yourself real quick. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Kelly Girardi, and I'm coming up on 10 years in the commercial space flight industry, which is an exciting milestone for me. And over that past decade, I've held roles in policy, media, business development and operations. Uh, it's been a wild ride. And then on an equally fulfilling side, I'm a citizen scientist. So I've had the opportunity to test spacesuits and NASA supported research in microgravity as part of Project Possum, which is a suborbital research program. And I've had the ability to, and privilege really, to build a large science communication platform on social media. Um, I'm very excited, as you mentioned, for the release of my first book. It's called Not Necessarily Rocket Science, Beginner's Guide to Life in the Space Age that just came out. I'm looking forward to talking about it today. And, uh, you know, the, the quick two second elevator pitch there is I'm trying to drive home that our next giant leap will require the contributions of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. It's not necessarily rocket science. So I'm excited to be here with you and Abby today and looking forward to it. Well, and I, and I love that part of it because I think it includes everybody. It's not just people that want to be astronauts or want to work on rockets. It's everybody that's an artist, a filmmaker, a poet, nutritionist, whatever you're into, there's, there's room at the table and you should be involved in contributing your ideas and, and making it a, a whole team effort. So, and then Abby, if you wanted to do a quick introduction, reintroduction of yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Abigail Bollenbach. I am almost 19. So I am a baby in this uh, in this field of science communication and astronomy, uh, but I have been passionate about astronomy and physics for the past five, six years and have been doing any type of outreach work at, for both of those and uh, any scientific event that I could get my hands on uh, that entire time. I created a youth group with my mentor in our local uh, astronomy club and we are actually the only astronomy club for children uh, 7 to 18 in the whole country that's not affiliated with the school which is great for us but that just goes to show we need to move on and we need to push forward and, and be a little bit more um, uh, pro STEM across the country and uh, well, pro astronomy just because I'm biased. Um, personally, this play has been um, kind of a blessing and a curse for all of us, I'm sure, but especially for me, because I've never been behind a camera this much in my entire life. I haven't had all the opportunities that I've had my entire life, and it's solely because of COVID. Um, just because of the communication that happens online and on social media, people have a stronger urge to reach out. And I was forced to not do speeches and travel and do lectures. So with Scott Roberts at Explore Scientific, I'm one of the Explore Alliance ambassadors. I did an online uh, lecture on pulsars and quasars. And the chief editor of Astronomy Magazine saw that, was interested in me. And at the end of it, I got my own educational series, which is phenomenal with them, which it's, it's very funny, Kelly, because my series is called Infinity and Beyond. It's actually rocket science. It's just the reverse of- We Eastern. need both. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Not rocket science. Just because there's so many people that have um, 
tormented me over the years, male, female, uh, supportive, not supportive individuals that have said, oh, it's just, it's rocket science. It's actually rocket science or it's not rocket science, Abby. And it, that always comes up. And so I couldn't resist saying it's actually rocket science in the series. Um, but the video series, we are on our 12th, 13th episode, and it's directed towards millennials and Gen Z's, but everyone is open to watch and all swaths of the age group uh, are entertained by it. Um, so it's, it's, it's for that attention span and which is about five minutes. Sometimes it goes a little longer and sometimes it doesn't, but we cover things from uh, late research to, uh, you know, upcoming research to different topics. I covered flat earth conspiracy theory. Um, so I, I debunk a lot of things. The next one coming up is going to be really cool. I'm excited. Uh, it's going to be on Star Trek. So I'm talking about Star Trek, the physics of Star Trek. Um, I'm a, a huge Trekkie, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, but there have been just so many people that I have met and the connections that I've made are amazing. I'm still like speeding by with all the awesome people I've met throughout this COVID journey. And it's solely because we have been forced to stay home and not see other people. So we're reaching out like uh, maniacs, which has benefited me so much. And I'm sure so many other people, but especially science communicators. So. Well, and that's my, my good dovetail. Thank you, Abby, because uh, Abby and I both pre-ordered your book uh, on Amazon yeah. and there's some technical uh, problems and delays, but but it actually magically showed up. Wow. Yesterday, so I'm so excited. That's so sweet. Thank you both. I was so excited too. This arrived literally like three minutes before I got on here. That yeah, is Abby awesome. and I were talking. Mine came yesterday, and I'm like, "Where's your book?" And she's like, "It's not here yet." I'm like, oh, very <laughs> so serendipitous. Thank yeah. you for the support. So, but that's you know, it's a Thanksgiving Day episode. I'm really thankful to Ooh. your new book coming out and you being with us on a launch day, and that was why. I'm kind of pulling the Gene Krantz with my material. I had a mission control background, but my phase, my phase was going. You with my have face an in excellent and background, and we actually. Oh, this is heavy, but <laughs> I, oh, I'm yeah. right there with you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So, uh, talking about your book, um, I want to get into that because I was reading through it a little bit last night when it arrived, and uh, I watched some other interviews you've done, kind of promoting the book. But we have some six degrees of separation connection, some Kevin Bacon thing going on because uh, I graduated Columbia College as a film major in Chicago. Look at that! Look at that! I did not know about your film background, you know, yeah. doing that, and then uh, and all work. of my film classes were at Columbia, so that's it's just small yeah. world. <laughs> Yeah, and then the other one that surprised me was, I know you worked for Maston Space Systems. Yeah. I don't know, I interviewed Stephen Lamb. I don't know if he was there. Not during not during my time. Okay. But that's another connection, absolutely. Yeah, because Maston was great. He, he was so awesome because he uh, uh, guest presented at a summer camp I was teaching virtually, like a STEM space camp we were doing. And I reached out to him on social media and he's like, yeah. What can we do? Zoom? Yeah, I'll get it on my phone. We'll do it. And he's showing us around, you know, the, the zombie and the Zodiac rockets are behind him. I don't think the kids still know how cool this was that, you know, they got a, a live Zoom presentation from a rocket shop. Absolutely. Oh, oh man, I sing the praises of Mastin all day long and dedicated a, a good chunk of the book to my time in Mojave. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that connection because that really struck me that I did not know you, you studied film and... Uh, and yeah. working with Mastin has been awesome. So let's get into your book. You know, what what fired you up about writing the book, which I kind of know a little bit, but I want you to talk about it. And then, and then just what, what are your, your hopes for the book as it launches out here? Absolutely. I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with the catalyst for the book is I have a film degree. I've been able to work in this field, a, a very engineering dominated field, and I've been able to do so with a liberal arts degree. And I think, you know, there there is a both a beauty in contributing different skill sets, but there's also an advantage to being able to get a diverse group of, of folks who are able to look at problems and be creative in different ways and contribute to, you know, creating different types of impact in a field like this. I wrote not necessarily rocket science because I was reflecting on the fact that the Renaissance, you know, that, that was a time where art was only one manifestation of this new way of thinking, but that cultural innovation was also happening across all these really different disciplines like medicine, technology, 
you know, religion, politics, philosophy, science, even warfare. And similarly, engineering innovation, I think, represents only one small slice of uh, life in the space age. And, you know, this is a broader cultural movement and uh, our next giant leap will require a diverse group of skill sets and perspectives. And so I really wanted to contribute and, and draw from my own non-linear, non-obvious path in the space industry to show that we need all of those talents. And, and you know, I, I think sometimes there is a little bit of elitism or, or a mis- understanding that you know the space industry is only reserved for the elitist of elite and and that's not the case we need a diversity of skill sets approaches um and and yeah later in the conversation i would love to talk more about 2020 in in particular because i do think that that this has really sharpened the lens um for all of spaceship earth on some of our priorities but but also specifically for the space industry and, and what we need to be prioritizing if we do want to earn humanity's trust in this next giant leap well, you know, why don't we get into that right now? Because I, I was touched too, like like Abby's talked about, I can share as well, which she knows. Um, same thing for me being in front of a camera. I never did any of this before COVID came in, but it was yeah. all hands on deck, like the education programs I do. My setup is pretty much, yeah. I do on-site visits at all the schools in the Hudson area here, and that all got put on hold. And then the work I do as a STEM program at the library, all the camps got, you know, indefinite hold and all that's so we're like what do we do you know how do we keep these kids engaged how do we reach out to them how do we let them know we're thinking about them and that we're still excited about the stuff that's out there how do we get it to them and uh so it turned into doing these interviews the videos stem demonstration things like like uh, emily calandrelli is doing awesome stuff at you know with she was doing it at home you know little stem experiments and she's doing balloons and flames and all this amazing stuff and we were doing the same kind of thing and so it's been finding a new path but it's been amazing for me because I'm getting to talk to you and Abby and all these amazing other people that I never would have uh, talked yeah. to. I, I was talking to Poppy Northcutt the other day, you know, the first Absolutely. flight controller mission control. And I'm like, I'm talking to my wife and she's like, how'd it go? I'm like, I can't believe I talked to her for, well, you know, it's just rock star stuff. And she's so giving of her time. And it's just been a great outreach and a great step up. And all these people that I work with at NASA and the education departments, you know, what can we mail you? Can we send you? tote bags with posters and bookmarks and stuff to get to the kids and I'm like yes you know you get it to me I'll figure out how to get it out to the teachers so that's been very heartening and kind of a troubling sad story time uh, on that end but, but we should dive into that so so please expand on on 2020 and, and how you've been dealing with that and yeah absolutely you know it's um it is a privilege to do what we do and to be able to to use this time and um, unlock bandwidth that we may not otherwise have had and energy and to be able to pour that into our passions all three of us I, I think it's an enormous privilege and, and one that I'm you know especially right now ahead of Thanksgiving really reflective on um, as we all know for so many people it, it has been quite the opposite and I think as I think about how that relates to the space industry it's like you know 2020 has sharpened the lens for a lot of folks and there's a reality that you know, there's this contrast and emotional dissonance between exhilarating space achievements. I mean, think of the things we've accomplished in space this year, crew one, you know, restoring access to the space station from US soil, just, just enormous decades in the making type of milestones. And then at the same time, the devastating earthly happenings, you know, an ongoing pandemic, uh, you know, racial injustice and disparities that are really coming to the surface long overdue. And while we all know that space is critical and that these are not binaries and it's not mutually exclusive, right? We need to better prepare the public, I think, as, as science communicators to grapple with that dissonance because I think it's only going to grow in the future as we continue to, you know, reach for further heights in space and inequity on earth comes, you know, becomes more apparent. I think we need to um, really invest time in telling the story of why both of these things are important to address and it's not one or the other. And I think we especially have to be careful around the politicization of uh, space and policy. <laughs> and that's, that's something that, that I care very deeply about. And so it's been really eye-opening for me. And I think, you know, above all, it's like our industry can never exist independent of what's happening on earth. Human spaceflight is built on humans, for humans, by humans. And so it's just this delicate, you know, intricately intertwined uh, topic. Um, and I think it's also really 
opened my eyes to some diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the space industry. You know, if you think our gender breakdowns are bad, obviously our racial disparities are, are terrible in the space industry. Um, and I think, you know, the stakes are just too high for any single demographic to steer the entirety of Spaceship Earth. And so that's something that I've been um, really trying to put a lot of focus in, whether it's at the conference level or speaking level or mentorship level and something that I've become really passionate about as I've thought more about it. Excellent. Abby, did you want to jump in on that? Because I, I think you've been very uh, socially active too in your, your social media and kind of addressing some of the issues that, that Kelly's been touching on as well. Yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> not necessarily in uh, space travel, more with uh, education and STEM education. Uh, currently, I'm part of a group called Passage, and um, we're just at the beginning stages of it, but uh, it, it covers something a little bit different that's been overlooked for many, many, many years, but over the past you know, three decades, um, main uh, stream education for, uh, you know, people that aren't in a third world country have just been fantastic. It's been elevated. We have gotten much better school systems and opportunities for kids, but not everywhere. Like, I, I mean, I take that for granted. Everyone takes that for granted. If you live in America, if you live in, you know, Canada and, and places that have established education and really that is a basic human right and not everybody has that. And so Passage um, is trying to uh, help kids that are in Latin America um, have more STEM opportunities, STEAM opportunities. Uh, and so Lee Giat created the uh, organization and kind of grabbed different social media influencers, uh, psychom communicators, uh, different teachers, um, and whatnot to participate in it and to help fundraise uh, so that we could get supplies over there, do projects over there. And we're also going to do a uh, educational masterclass video series. And so I'm going to do that too. None of us have picked a topic yet. And <clears throat> what I don't want to do is I don't want to pick a topic uh, like, let's say, string theory or something, and then offend a physicist that has been in that field for you know 10, 20 years. And then me being a shrimp is like, I'm gonna tell you about string theory kids. So that's that's my excuse for procrastinating. But um, honestly, I really don't have one. Uh, I'll probably just do a basic intro to astronomy or something realistically. I'm so excited about it. We all are, uh, and, and really and truly, if anyone uh, is interested in donating that's watching, I strongly advise just, you know, $5, $5 helps because these kids could grow into future engineers, future astronauts, doctors. I mean, we don't know. That is the, the next generation. They're going to carry our civilization to the next level. So PASSAGE stands for um, uh, <clears throat> providing for aid in science for South America's general education. And what I think all science communicators are trying to do is to make really any form of STEAM field more uh, inclusive because the sciences period are, are famed to be exclusive, uh, you know, genres. And we, that needs to be for everybody. That, that doesn't need to be, you know, for the kid that got, you know, straight A's, that's going to Harvard and that has his way paid. That, that could be for somebody that is, you know, playing on the streets that might be in trouble they might still be interested in science and they should have those same opportunities, just like those kids in Latin America. And so that's really what uh, I've been focusing on is passage and then also sharing my passions on social media as well for the gig that I have with Astronomy Magazine. And um, I have been very limited with my youth club here because it is COVID and since it is uh, in our hometown, we aren't doing actual in-person meetings. We tried to do a couple um, social distancing meetings where it was outside and there was a limited amount of people. And I mean, they're children. They can't, they can't do that. That's against their nature. That's why I think it's so preposterous that little kids are being little around to run in schools. And there's a certain age that they start wearing masks. It's like third grade, you're required to wear a mask or fourth grade, you're required to wear a mask. Otherwise, 
no, you're fine. I think that's crazy. But, but again, it's also kind of crazy for you to expect that age group, that, that smaller age group where it is, you know, imperative for you to latch on an interest if you want them to grow in it or excel in it, you know, about, you know, five to 10, that's, you know, a very uh, formative age they're not going to pay attention behind a camera. They're going to get bored behind a screen in like 20 minutes, unless it's, you know, paw, paw pets or whatever those like, uh, you know, cartoons that are on the TV show now. Paw Patrol is the correct Paw Patrol, name. that's yeah. it. You have no idea how much Paw Patrol I've seen <laughs> or heard of. Or if I talk to a little kid, they're like, oh, do you watch Paw Patrol? It's like the first thing out of their mouth. Um, My daughter is a, a mega Paw Patrol fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, I'm sure you can relate probably to an extent more than I can because you have to actually sit there and watch the whole thing with her. <laughs> we got the books, the toys, the videos, the whole, oh, wow. we're, we're, we're bought. Well, and, and I've been struggling with that too on the, the whole, how do you package a program now? Yeah. To Abby's point, you know, on the screen time, because I did a Boy Scout program and it was kind of a hybrid I worked out with the troop leader where I dropped off a banker's box of physical activities and kits I had like gallon bags for each uh, Cub Scout had stickers and bookmarks and the activity we were doing straw rockets and that and I dropped them off like two weeks in advance so they they could have been quarantined and set aside and then he handed them out and then we did the zoom and to your point you know we tried to keep it moving and quick and yeah. energetic on and because yeah, I don't want to turn into a half hour lecture, you know, with slides by me right. on Zoom because the kids just, you lose them. You can't keep it, but it was great. Cause then I said, I need you to find this in the bag and then put the bag down. And they rummaged around through the bag and found it. So I thought it, it broke it up enough where they were engaged. It was fun, but yeah, I've been racking my brain on how do you That's a keep great it engaging thing. and keep it where they look forward to it, where they had a good time and they're, they're gonna have an interest after you go away on the Zoom, so. Right, yeah. Uh, the majority of our meetings, whenever we would meet, it would be just about once a month. Um, there would be maybe a, a 20 minute segment where I talked about something, whether it be about um, the solar system formation, some form of a, of a factoid that they would find interesting and possibly retain. That would be interesting to a, you know, a 10 year old, which is about the average age for our group. Uh, and we've got we've got younger too, so it's not really heavy content stuff. Uh, and then the rest of the time, we would be doing hands-on things, whether it would be observing, um, using star charts, learning how to use certain equipment, uh, doing crafts. I mean, we did crafts every single time, two to three different types of crafts. I created a uh, star little like a what, what are those little globes that. Uh, people hang over their baby beds. It was kind of like that, but you hung it on the wall and it was different types of stars. And I taught them, you know, what a, a neutron star was, a red giant, you know, supermassive stars versus, you know, dwarf stars. And we painted the little like star reform balls and they were really cool. But I don't know how to do that over Zoom. I mean, you know, you could do rockets, like you said, that's a great idea, but we've already done rockets so many times. I had to get more and more creative, even in person. And so I, yeah, uh, it, it's just that, that has suffered a lot from the pandemic. Uh, yeah. Otherwise everything else has greatly excelled. <laughs> well, and, and jumping off of that, Kelly, I know you, uh, another cool thing you've done in addition of your stable of cool things you keep rolling out every month here, you launched a clothing line oh, wow. on top of everything else. And, uh, I'm going to fess up. I love the shirt. I'm still trying to figure out if I can pull it off, but the, uh, the get in loser. And this one is it's never aliens. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> this one. Yeah. The get in uh, loser. We're did, going to space. Yeah. I love that shirt. I'm like, can I pull that off? I don't know if I can pull that off. Yes, but, you can. but uh, that seems to have been a, a huge hit and people really responding it well to it. And I see a lot of people on social media posting that they've received their order and, uh, and giving a shout out to your website. So yeah. I'm assuming you've gotten pretty good feedback on that launch so far. Definitely. It's been really fun. And, and I, I never take any of this stuff lightly. The fact that someone would, would spend their money to purchase a design of mine, it just is incredible. Or a book of mine, including both of you. I, it's just um, something I'm so grateful for the support and it blows my mind. But um, I do think that, you know, it fits in the same theme. It's like, 
something that I've always uh, felt very strongly about and, and coming probably from a more defensive place with a film degree in the space industry is that people have multitudes. And, you know, I, I think investing in each parts of, of your own passions and those parts of yourself that are unique and different are, are really important. And so with the, with the clothing line, um, you know, the, the catchphrases like, you know, get in loser, we're going to space, which is a tongue in cheek mean girls reference. It's like, yes, you, you can, you know, you can be um, someone in STEM in a very serious field or discipline who also loves pop culture, right? They're, they're not, uh, once again, they're not mutually exclusive. And the same thing, you know, it's tongue in cheek, it's never aliens, you know, in response to all of the clickbaity articles, like breaking news, scientists are baffled by, you know, um, things like that. And, and of course the, the staple, not necessarily rocket science um, for, for the STEAM folks and, and science communicators. And I, I've had a lot of fun with that and I've really, doubled down on that aspect of my personality and everything I do um, and, and really embraced the fact that I, I do love fashion. I do have these other interests outside of space that are equally worthy in my mind of attention, investment and fulfillment. And so being able to blend the two in something like a clothing line was really exciting. I did one in 2016 called Paper Rocket and it was a money pit. I spent a lot of money <laughs> and um, while I did sell out with the capsule collection, I'd never broke even. And it was a, it was a higher end, um, more glamorous line. Now it's we're doing t-shirts and sweatshirts <laughs> and uh, I'm coming back down to, to, to what I can afford to. So um, it's been really fun. That's awesome. Well, and then uh, come back to your book. <clears throat> I think it's great. And I, I know that you're casting the net pretty wide. A lot of people can read this. Do you, did you have an age group in mind? Like when you were writing it, like I want to see this in the hand of you know, this person or this age group, were you kind of aiming at a sweet spot for it or? It, it's a great question. And it's one that my poor publishers have been hounding me to answer since day one. It's the only section I left blank in the book proposal. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I was too squirmy to be pinned down to one age. Right. Group. But what I, what I kept telling them and what, what I'll share again is the real audience that I envisioned for this is 19 year old Kelly, myself coming out of, you know, Ooh. school and <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know, funny enough, um, you, you know, and having all of this sort of um, both existential, just insecurity about the fields, confusion about what I wanted to do in my career. Can I dabble? Do I have to have it all figured out right now? Why is this stuff important? Could I ever be accepted in this industry with a film degree? just all of these things. And then also unlocking just the amazement and the wonder of human spaceflight and, and going through that process myself post-college and really having my eyes opened to what it means to be alive in this unique window of history, the first time in 4.5 billion years that it's possible for us to you know, settle other worlds and expand our footprint in the cosmos and, and sort of enjoying the ride of understanding the gravity, not to use a bad pun of all of that. And so um, that was what I had in mind, but I think the book is very accessible for you know, eighth grade up in terms of reading level. It's family friendly, obviously, mm -hmm. in, in the sense that it is talking very positively about you know, space and my personal experiences. Um, but I think it also works for a, a space enthusiast. You know, I, I really was aiming yeah. to speak to anyone who has a passion, whether or not they wanna turn that into full-time employment in the industry. Well, that's wonderful because one of, one of the many hats I wear is I run the, the Space Club, which is an after-school club at the Hudson High School. And that's obviously been put on hold as well. But when we were doing that, uh, happily surprised me that the bulk of the membership was women. Uh, I, at one time, I only had one male student. It was about 12 girls. And I think I had one male student in there. And it was that yeah. flip that you didn't expect. And it was awesome. But the girls talked about, kind of I think what you're touching on a little bit, referencing back to your younger self, that there wasn't really a lot of network or support or a glide, glide path, kind of a route marked out where you could go if you were into this stuff, if you're into aviation or you're into aerospace or you, you kind of had to figure it out and knock on doors on your own. And so I think the girls, at least in the feedback I got on my little sliver of the universe here in Hudson was that they really appreciated that kind of camaraderie and network where they could all share the bits and pieces they've been hearing from teachers or hearing opportunities online or an internship thing, did you see this? So it almost became a clearinghouse as opposed to me kind of running a program just to allow them to have a juice pouch and some cookies and kind of talk about 
all these things that I just rattled off, but they, I think they like the peer support group aspect of it. So I kind of let it morph into that. I wasn't forcing it to go into a category to be any one thing, but I really like that on your book too. Cause I think you're kind of throwing a, a life preserver out to people that are maybe in that group that don't have that club or opportunity. Yeah. We're, we're sh shooting stars at Abby over there. Cause she's in that wheelhouse for it. But, but I think it's great for that too, just because per Abby's point on passage and other communities that may not support space or have an astronomy club or have that kind of built in, research, which is honestly why I started doing this in Hudson, because there wasn't any of that when I moved up here from Chicago. There was no uh, great planetarium. There's no, the nearest NASA center is Glenn out in Cleveland. You know, there's nothing around here uh, kind of built in to support STEM or, or anybody to promote those kind of careers uh, with NASA or aerospace or Maston or anything else, because like, like that example, going back to that, nobody's heard of Mastin, you know, out here. When I bring in a program, that is literally brand new the first time they're ever hearing about it. Absolutely. And that's been kind of my goal is to say, these are the different things going on. And you all know the big ones like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, but there's a million little companies like you working in defense and all that that the kids don't ever hear about. That doesn't come on the radar because it's yeah. what Lockheed Martin's doing. And you don't hear about that because it's not going to the space station or whatnot, but they're doing a lot of critical work every day. And so I try to put a lot of that out there on the burner for, uh, for kids to get just exposed to. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I always, when I speak with um, younger folks, especially ones who are from different countries that don't have the same space industry ecosystem or even a, a space presence nationally of their own, um, I do encourage them to look at it as an opportunity to to be among the first. You know, I you know I, I always think back to um, the group, the all female uh, Afghan robotics team, and these girls. Just I wrote about them in the book, but meeting them uh, was so inspiring and energizing to me because you know here they are in a country that was you know so recently Taliban rule where education was, was not allowed for, for girls like them. And here they are kicking ass, or, sorry, kicking butt in on a world stage, you know, um, with robotics and they are just, they're doing it. And I, I just think like that determination, that perseverance um, and the, the blessing of a more globally connected society, like Abby was saying in the beginning, thanks to social media and digital connectivity to be able to build those bridges and to connect me with them and you know anyone else that they want to talk to and have that access and to be able to amplify their message and support their goals similar to what it, what Abby is doing with the organization she mentioned it, it's really a unique time and i think the commercial space industry is just going to play such a huge role in democratizing access to space for researchers for scientists for students for yeah. civilians for tourists yes I'm, I'm very bullish on tourism because I think part of expanding earth's economic sphere is absolutely extended to the hospitality industry and, and getting that investment and proving a market but I think all of that you know imagine a commercial space station where you don't need a sovereign a space program of your nation's own, but you could send a representative on a cosmic ride share, you know, to go spend time. And then suddenly you do have a presence in space as a nation and it's a national point of pride. I think the next decade or two are gonna be really formative in the global perspective of space and, and hopefully mitigate some of the haves and the have nots when it comes to access. Well, and, and reading your book last night, I actually uh, cheered out loud. I threw both arms in the air because I was reading your one passage. You're kind of talking about that this is this new golden age of space. And I'm like, you know, yes, because as you just talked about, I'm talking to the kids and they think I'm kind of teasing them when I start a presentation. I'm like, you guys are living the life. This is it. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, because they're like, what about Neil Armstrong? All the good stuff happened back then. I'm like, no. And I rattle off. So when I was a kid, there was the space shuttle. And then I show them the chart. I'm like, now we've got crew dragon and you've got starliner and you've got orion coming online and we've got uh virgin galactic and you've got new shepherd with uh, you know blue origin and they're building their new glenn i said the amount of vehicles the amount of access the amount of democratization the amount of customers scientists they're i'm just reading about alan stern you know is going to get his flight to do a ride along you know, for yeah. some, Alan's so, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the kids kind of get it because I show all these slides of the different vehicles that are either online or coming online and uh, all these things that are going to be happening in the next, you know, five to yeah. 10 years. It's just amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, just to do one quick shout out because today is a, you know, a good anniversary in the commercial space community. 
you know, it goes to show the work that happens behind the scenes to make these public-private partnerships possible, uh, because it is an extraordinary step change, you know, from what we've been used to with the National Space Program. And, you know, it was on this day in 2015 that Barack Obama signed the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, and it was a bill that really was designed to help develop the commercial space industry and um, uniting legislation with all of these possibilities of, of space innovation. And I was with Commercial Space Flight Federation at the time. And um, this is a copy of that bill that oh. was signed on this day in 2015 um, by then President Obama, um, CSF. And it, it's just a reminder that, you know, for, for every incredibly critical scientists and engineer and, and, and rocket scientists. Behind the scenes are these multitude of skill sets that are working around the clock, whether it's on legislative affairs, whether it's on public relations, communications, staffers, White House liaisons, FAA, government you know, service employees. It, it's just, it's an ecosystem. And I think it, one cannot exist without the other. And we are just in a debt of gratitude to a number of folks um, for the last decade who have been working towards some of these exciting goals like Crew One <laughs> launching. Well, yeah, I think it's always a great point to stress on all the people you don't see, like the, to use a film term, the below the line people, yeah. you know, that you don't see because everybody knows the stars for a show, but you don't know grip electric and the focus pullers and catering and craft services and wardrobe and all the people you don't right. see that are making the thing you love, you know, happen every day. They're the editors and special effects and graphics people. And but those are the names that fly by on the credits at the end that you don't uh, ever totally. get to see or hear about. It's the exact same thing for my bad metaphor to the space program. Cause like you're talking about all those people you rattled off, nobody's going to know their name. Nobody's going to see them. Uh, and I've adopted the thing I'm doing with the kids. I'll put up a photo of somebody like that, be it a seamstress or an engineer or somebody. That I'm like, this is the coolest person you don't know. And you've got to know this person. And I'll explain a little bit about what they do or their background or how they came into aerospace or whatever. But I'm like, they do a critical job. You know, the astronauts, their life depends. If I'm doing like the seamstress one I just mentioned, you know, their, the astronauts' lives depend on the work, in this case, that she is doing. But you're never going to see her. She's never going to be signing autographs anywhere at a convention or anything like that. But it's a critical job. She's very well trained at it. And she's a team member of this organization that, 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 that has to turn out perfect work. Not just good. It has to be literally perfect. Like it has to pass the x-ray inspections and all that. And if it's not perfect, it has to be redone uh, from scratch again. That's, that's the standard. It's not this is good enough. It has to be literally perfect or, yeah. or it can't happen. Totally. And it's great news for people whose aspirations lie in, in different fields. You know, if, if you're a rock star lawyer, it's like space needs you. We need to yeah. untangle the planetary rights, you know, to property in space as we, you know, start commercial operations or, or extraction of resources. We need uh, financial wizards. Look at companies like Virgin Galactic who are going public. We need HR professionals, you know, the, the next generation and workforce of folks who are dedicating their lives to to, to the space industry, um, you know, that's, it's talent, uh, you know, acquisition and retention is going to be a huge deal. And so all of these different skill sets, um, you know, or, or more entrepreneurial and business minded folks being able to come into this ecosystem and start something of their own. It's, uh, I, I just think it's such a cool opportunity to, to see the industry really taking shape in all of these different directions and all of these different offshoots. That's awesome. I had, I had one last question on my list of questions to ask you, and then we can go wherever the conversation wraps up. But I wanted to talk to both of you on the, the social media aspect. If you had advice for young ladies, because I know that's a thing that's blown up in recent years with Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all that. Yeah. I know both of you have probably had some experience with um, uh, men being negative, whatnot. And uh -huh. I kind of talked to, well, and it's a yeah. tricky, it's a tricky uh, balancing act for me to walk, as you would guess, if I'm talking to third and fourth grade classrooms, these are people that have different levels of sophistication at social media. You know, some parents aren't allowing anything in the house to others that tell me after I present, you know, I follow you on Instagram and I'm like kind of taken aback. So I'm like, why are you even on Instagram? But they're, they'll come up and tell me that, you know, their, their parent found my website or whatever. And now they're following me on, and that means they have an Instagram account and they're in like fourth grade or whatever. So some of that has been a learning process for me on how to talk about it. And, and I didn't know if you had any advice to share on young women that may be watching this 
that are excited to model off of what you're doing and they want to have be, be a science communicator they want to put up interesting you know videos or when they go to kennedy space center they want to post a bunch of photos of doing that can you talk at all about you know the good and the bad or how you navigate that or best practices or, or what helps you uh, uh, maintain it each day or, or the benefits to it yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's an enormous privilege, full stop. And so, it, you know, I, I have overwhelmingly positive um, experience having the opportunity to have such a large platform and community and to have conversations and relationships with hundreds of thousands of people on the internet is not something I take lightly. But to your point, um, there have absolutely been tolls taken on my mental health. Um, as a result of that, there's an enormous pressure to keep up, to keep producing content, to keep putting more of yourself out there. Um, it is something I signed up for, obviously. So, you know, I, I'm in full awareness that, that, you know, I signed myself up for that pressure. Um, it can hurt when, you know, people have very direct, like we all know, behind a keyboard, you know, people will act very differently than they might if you were interacting in person. And so in direct proportion to the amount of exposure that I give people into my private life, so too does the door open for critiques and for commentary and for, you know, unsolicited opinions. Um, and that's been, it's been difficult, but I, I think, you know, knowing that that comes with the territory has been helpful and knowing when I need to step away is also helpful. Um, but I will say on the flip side, I am someone who overshares. <laughs> it's just part of my personality. If you get me talking, I, I won't stop. And um, that has come into play so many times where I've needed the support of my community. You know, I, at one point I, I suffered a, a miscarriage and the ability to talk to my community about that and be fully transparent about suffering a loss in a second trimester really buoyed me and, and it, it energized me. And I, I, it's something that I look back and it's like, thank God I had such a supportive community to, to fall back on when I needed their support. And um, things like that just make me think, you know, so grateful to be alive in a time where that's possible. And in, in, in answer to, you know, advice for, for young folks who are thinking of starting out, it's like, set your limits early, decide exactly what you want to put out there. You know, it doesn't have to be everything under the sun you know, decide what is off limits for the internet and, and what isn't. And then, you know, I, I would say what I think really earned me um, a little bit more of a connection with, with the folks who chose to follow me is that I did infuse my personality with it. If we're talking about something scientific, I'm not just presenting the data, I'm presenting the whole package of here's why I am so pumped about this. Like, here's what's exciting to me about this. Here's my daughter thinking about this. You know, it, it's yeah. sort of, you know, my personal choice has been to really um, intertwine the two, my, my love of the science with my communication of the impact. And, and so I think that's something that's, you know, there are pluses and minuses to, to everything, but it's something I've really benefited a lot from and enjoyed. Excellent. Abby, did you want to jump in on that? Sure, yeah. Um, I think my uh, biggest struggle with social media is the illusion of perfection. So I'm not going to post a picture that shows, um, you know, a, a blemish or two that I got from, you know, a, a very inopportune time in the month. <clears throat> and it's not going to have a, a post, you know, shot of my pores or scars. And I'm not going to post the most realist, raw, part of my life on social media, it's going to be, you know, maybe slightly filtered, maybe a nice lighting, maybe it's going to be, uh, you know, one of the, the best points in my life, and it's going to be the best image out of, you know, 80. And that's what you're going to see. That's, that, that's it. There's no backstory. You don't, you just see the illusion of perfection. And all of our front stories are like that. Um, but that's not real. That's not how anyone's life is. And I'm sure any social media influencer or science communicator understands that, but it, it's still it's it's still hard even whenever you're doing that and you're putting your best you know image forward and your best self forward and that's the front story. It's still hard not to compare yourself to others and their success, their images. And so I think the key thing to realize and understand is kind of what you touched on, Kelly is to know when to step back, to know when to take a break and to remove yourself and reground 
uh, your worth. Um, not do you know the extreme self comparison, even though it is inevitable at some point. Just because we are seeing everyone's um, you know best self and their successes and whatnot, so it is it is hard not to uh, you know compare and contrast. Well, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not that, that that successful. Well, she's younger than me. Why? I mean, I could be doing that. Or well, she's pretty or she's smarter. Wow, that's so cool. And maybe reroute that. Uh, from your anxiety or insecurities and try to use it as a, uh, a positive outlook. Like I aspire to be like that. I want to be as good as that. I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of him. That is so cool. I want to do that too. And it's hard to reroute those negative um, commentary, uh, you know, negative self-talk that happens because it, 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 ingrained in our psyche to constantly improve ourselves. And so if, if we're not um, kind of conditioned to do that in a positive outlook or aspect, then it, it is going to fall into a, a negative path. And I think that is one of the most um, detrimental things in, uh, in social media, even though it is such a powerful tool, uh, I think that is the downfall of most everyone. And so I, still to this day have, have uh, set a goal for myself that, you know, at, at the point where I am happy where my skin's at, because I have um, acne scars and they're objectively exponentially better than what they were, you know, four or five years ago, um, whenever I was going through an extreme hormonal phase, uh, you know, puberty, God, whew. Um, but I, I, I've set a goal that at, at this point where I'm happy enough with my skin, where this scar is gone, or where, where you know, I, I will be confident enough or secure enough, I'm going to post an image of no makeup, no filter, no nothing. And that gets moved every year. And so I think you, we need to lower our self expectations and accept who we are and our imperfections as being okay. And I think as a culture, really, this is a cultural problem, period, um, and a global problem. Uh, but, but I think really, if, if we could all do that, we could accept each other and it would, it would just be, it would be a lot less like, hectic. It would be more real. It would be more wholesome. Um, and I, I think that's, that, that's been one of my major mistakes. And I, I've, I've met a lot of people and talked to a lot of people and that has been a, a lot of their struggles with social media. Um, I think the other portion is to, um, post things that you would want your grandma to see or that you would want other family members or other younger children looking at you and saying, oh, wow, she's so cool. She looks like a superhero. I want to be like her, not extraordinarily uh, risque images or anything like that if you want to be someone that is influencing someone else. Now, if you want to use your platform for you know, modeling or anything like that, then skin is beautiful. The human body is gorgeous, but there is a certain category for that and there's a, you know conduct on becoming is a thing and um there are a lot of beautiful women out there that are signed communicators but i think you know just because of the world that we live in misogyny and the prejudice is never going to go away until we filter a lot of those people out which is going to take you know many 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 years and generations of uh, uh you know, healthy teaching for individuals to understand that we are all equal. Um, it's not anyone's fault, depending on their race or their gender, but there is still that primal aspect. And if you are wearing something that is extraordinarily revealing, you just slightly maybe downgrade some respect or, or some seriousness to that topic. Not that, you know, bikinis aren't fun, but that might not necessarily need to go on your social media page. And so I think those are uh, my two main points and advice uh, for anyone that wants to, to do that, just to be more of who you are. And, uh, and, and maybe if, if you are self-conscious about that blemish, maybe just leave, leave it, leave it alone because we all have those. <laughs> well, no, and I, and it's okay. I I thank both of you for talking about that. Well, and just in part of the conversation, I know not every parent can do this, but I, I don't know if either of you are familiar with uh, 
Abigail Harrison, who goes by the handle Astronaut Abby. Yes. With the Mars generation. I met her, I think uh, she was in high school. I believe she was a junior when I first met her at an event uh, at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And she was about a junior. And I talked with her mom was there, her mom, because she had all this great social media going on. And I, again, I know this isn't realistic for every parent, but her mother managed all of her social media at that time. You know, she was a, ju you know, a junior in high school and wasn't an adult yet, but she wanted to put all her experiences out there and how she was working toward being an astronaut and uh, thought it was fantastic and got to talk to her and her mom and her mom told me that she was managing the account. And so she would see all the messages, all the comments, and she would organize it and delete and like and, and do all that stuff uh, for her until she you know, transferred and kind of taking it over, um, having more input on and control as she went into college. And, and I can definitely relate to that because I am one of the busiest people that I know. Um, <laughs> because I work, I'm burning it for both ends of the candle and I'm about to introduce uh, you know, college physics into that. And so uh, I am not ignorant of the fact that I don't have the time and uh, my mom has definitely helped me immensely in that uh, realm of social media because sometimes I just don't, I don't wanna deal with it. Right. It's not my priority, I have other things going on. And if I had my brothers, I would sound super rude i wouldn't you know comment or anything like that it's just like no you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> like but yeah so i yeah. completely relate with that <laughs> excellent excellent well kelly we are coming up on the the end of our hour here so i just wanted to give one more shout out to the book i'm showing my cover Thank again you. and then is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about or, or a message in the book that we didn't get to or anything that you'd like to, to touch on before we wrap up here no, I think we covered it so well, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for having me again. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to hearing what people think of the book. I, I hope there's something in there for everyone. And if nothing else, I hope it's just a fun read about this special point in history. No, it's excellent. I, as I said, I just started it last night. I know Abby got her copy today. I'll be yeah. reading it through the mm -hmm. holiday break. And then I'm, uh, I'm pitching it to be a, a book club book for our high school uh, age groups. So I'll see how that goes, if that gets adopted uh, at the, the local library and stuff. But I just want to thank you both for sharing your early holiday time Likewise. with me. And uh, it's been wonderful um, to get to speak with you both. Could I add some, uh, just one thing? I, yeah. I just wanted to say, Kelly, I completely admire you and aspire to hopefully be as successful and as beautiful as you are. Um, You're so kind. Age. But I really appreciate infinitely the people like you and the other women in this field, depending on if it's in the engineering arts or in the sciences of space, because that's, I'm biased, but that's where I'm going. Um, because I wouldn't be able to walk through the doors where I'm at now, if it wasn't for you guys. And I, I can't imagine the difficulties that you had to face and battle at your age, whenever you were my age. And, and, and now you are at, at, you know, you're peaking and you're you know, successing and, you know, crushing all of your, uh, you know, used to be failures or imperfections or overcoming different, uh, if, you know, enemies or situations or whatnot and, and difficulties that you, you had to face and the challenges. And I just, I, I can't, I can't empathize to the extent for what, what you had to go through and I'm sure the same goes for you for the people that went before you. We're all, you know, kind of paving the way for each other. But I, I seriously do really feel very fortunate because of, of people like you. It is, it, it's that much easier, uh, you know, women in the sciences, in, uh, you know, the physics field and, and space um, and engineering are more accepted now. And that's, that's partly because of you. And I really, really, uh, I, I have to say, I, I completely you know, feel just so blessed. And I am so lucky that I get to speak with you right now. It's so cool. So kind of you and, and, and very similarly to you, I'm so excited to see where your career takes you. I, I know you're going to do amazing things, but I, I do appreciate that immensely. It warms my heart and, and, and just makes me so happy. So thank you for, for so generously sharing that with me. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Ladies, I hope you will have an excellent Thanksgiving holiday. And Kelly, when you do fly to space, I request a booking for another interview. I'd like I to will be, in be the top, back. top five interview lines up when you get back. But, uh, but great success with the book. And, and uh, thank you again for your time.